Hey, this is Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast, and we are kicking off today another interview for our 2020 Servant Leader Series. And today we're interviewing a guy who has played with some of the best in the world, literally some of the best NFL football players in the world, played in Canada, been a, a, a Grey Cup winner in Canada, played with the triplets, triplets as you may know them, in, in Dallas with uh, Irving and Aikman and Emmett Smith. And the opportunity to play at that level requires a lot of discipline. It requires a lot of personal leadership skills. It requires a lot of self-leadership. And some of the things we're gonna talk about today with Mike Kisilek are not just what it means to lead in an arena like the football uh, game and being a champion player, but also what it means to lead in life, what it means to lead the people around you. And now in his new role as a father and a coach and a husband, how many people does he impact and influence there? So help me welcome, if you will, Mike Kisselak. Mike, thank you for being thank here. Thank you. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you so much. So <clears throat> you went from high school in Jersey, is that right? New York. New York. Mm -hmm. And then from there on to college, you, and you yeah. played where in college? University of Maryland. University of Maryland. Terps. Terrapins. The one with a great looking helmet. What is a terrapin? It's a snapping turtle. <laughs> a big one. Really? <laughs> yeah. Vicious. Exactly. Vicious. Don't make us... And in, in the water, we're vicious. On land, I don't know so much. <laughs> All right, so then you moved on from college, and where was the first place you played after college? Well, quite honestly, I was an athletic mercenary. Uh, that's what I tell where people all the time. Wherever I wrote a check, I'd be there to play because I love the game of football. And um, I, went, I remember when I cried uh, after high school, I didn't know if I was going to go play again. Next thing you know, I get picked up, and I get a couple offers from different schools, and I ended up going to University of Maryland. And then... Um, from there, I went uh, at the end of Maryland, the last game I played, I remember I cried. I was like, am I going to go play again? Next thing you know, I go to the NFL Combine, and I end up going to uh, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs. So that's why I, that's my favorite AFC team, because they were the first person to, uh, first group shot. to give me a shot. It's exactly. And so, so how long did you play at the Chiefs? I was there for a drink of water, almost as long as I'll be here today. <laughs> I'm just joking, but uh, no, I played for the uh, training camp, and um, I got cut a lot. Um, I always tell people, talk about perseverance. Uh, that's exactly what happens. I got cut from there, then I went and played in the World League of American Football down in San Antonio, and that team was the San Antonio Riders, and for you San Antonians, I know how to say San Antonio now. So. <laughs> you got to say it right. Exactly. Like so New Orleans. Funny. Exactly. New Orleans, exactly. Or Illinois, not noise. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then from there I went to, and this might be the whole show if I could tell you everywhere I went, but uh, I went from there, I uh, played with Jason Garrett, was our quarterback there, um, and we went from, uh, I went from there and I went to the Houston Oilers. <coughs> Jack Pardee was the head coach, um, and, uh, and we pl played there, you know, likes of Warren Moon and, and wow. some of those great players out there. And um, uh, got to play down there for a little while. Again, same thing happens. You're cut, and the next thing you're like, what am I going to do? Well, I had a second-year contract with the World League, so I went back to San Antonio and um, um, met my wife there and um, went to, and a, a quick side note, if you guys don't mind, um, it's a, uh, uh, I met my wife during training camp. I was, um, I was after practice, I was leaving, and uh, we were at, San, in, at Trinity University in San Antonio, and we had a uh, training camp there and we were breaking camp going back to the uh, dorms and stuff to go shower and whatever and there's this there's this guy yelling I guess he knew me and he's uh, he's got this beautiful girl next to him I'm like of course I'll go sign an autograph <laughs> so I go sign the autograph and and um, and it ends up that after I got uh, you know I made uh, I was with the Oilers for a little while then I got cut from there I came back to play with San Antonio again because I had a second year contract and I never did give up my my apartment, which was strategically placed for a single guy right next to the swimming pool of the, oh, of, of, the of the establishment, because I like to <laughs> cool off a lot, you might say. Anyway, there's this beautiful girl that walks by. Says, Man, she looks familiar. Ended up being that girl that was with that guy, and then next thing you know, we were married. I think nine months later, eight months later, actually. Wow. So, uh, and then from there, um, that was 27 years ago, by the way. I was just going to ask how long you've been married now. Yeah, and um, 20. You just have the one daughter, right? Just have the one daughter. God bless us with, and, and that's a whole other story. <laughs> But uh, we could be here all day, I promise you. But from there, I went to uh, um, th there. I went to the Giants, okay, and, um, and then from the Giants, got released from there again. I ended up going into the uh, the the uh, CFL came to the U.S. There was like I don't know four or five teams that played in the U.S. for about three years, 
And um, I played in Sacramento, Sacramento Gold Miners. And then that team um, moved to San Antonio again. So we were back in San Antonio. And then after San Antonio, they, they dispersed, they did a dispersal draft because they were, the, the CFL wasn't really working in the US. So they pulled us while we were still under contract. So they drew us back up to Canada. And um, Don Matthews was the head coach of the Toronto Argonauts and said, Mike, I think you're the best offensive lineman, the best center in the league. I want you on my team. What's it going to take? I said, all you got. <laughs> you know, <laughs> of course, that's what you're going to ask. Yeah. And um, he said, no, seriously, what do you want? I said, I want to be the highest paid offensive lineman if you think I am. Well, I got it. Wow. That plus one dollar. So I was the highest paid over, got out of Winnipeg, Blue Bombers that was there for years, gave me that. You know, remember, CFL stands for cash flow is low and uh, not Canadian Football League. I'm just joking because by the time you transfer it over, by the time you take, pay your taxes, it's socialist country, so your taxes are high. And then, um, and then we uh, uh, also had, um, you know, the exchange rate at the time wasn't right. very good either. So when I got back from uh, each year from, because uh, it's a two-year contract, each year you... Uh, um, I had to get a job within two weeks, you know, I'm just, <laughs> it wasn't that bad. But, um, but then I went back and we won, we won the Grey Cup two years in a row, uh, which was, you know, by far a great experience for me um, and, and my family. And then we went and um, I won um, some accolades there. I, I was able to be blessed with the uh, uh, Outstanding Offensive Lineman in the League Award. Uh, it goes from team to uh, uh, region, which is the East and the West divisions. I like the AFC NFC here, right. and then um, and then it was overall, and I, I got to win that two years in a row. We got to win two Grey Cups in so a row. So it's like a Pro Bowl yeah, kind of yeah. a Yeah, I, I was already um, well. Actually, it was above that. It's the best offensive lineman oh, wow. total in the league, um, which was by far a, a, a incredible compliment to me and and, and honor. But um, three years in a row, I was on the um, the Pro Bowl, basically the All Star team they called it, and then. Uh, uh, winning it two years in a row, winning the Grey Cup two years in a row, winning all those awards and nothing else really for me to win up in Canada. I wanted to come home, of course, so um, I ended up um, moving back to San Antonio. My wife and I were trying to figure out what we were going to do. We were going to stay in San Antonio. She worked for Southwest Airlines at the time, and um, and she's like, what are we going to do? She was like, well, you know what? I'm, I'm, I want to get out of here. I'm transferring, and she gets a transfer uh, to either Cleveland or Chicago or something like that. So she, she's from Cleveland, um, uh, Ohio. And I'm like, but I play football. I got to play football. Where am I going to go play football? You know, and and so we had this big argument. Next thing you know, we hear on back back in the day, there was these things, you young guys, that was called a recording machine, uh, answering machine. So we had to re rewind it and listen to it. And the first call uh, was her getting her transfer from San Antonio, and I can't remember. I say it was Chicago. She says it was Cleveland. It's a C, okay, yeah. city up north. And then of course I'm like. All right, well, the next one is Todd Williams, who's still a dear friend of mine. He's pretty much the right-hand man of uh, Stephen Jones. He calls up and he's like, hey, we want to offer you a contract. Come up and work out for us, you know, the, the, um, the um, Dallas Cowboys. I look at her, she goes, well, I guess we're moving to Dallas. So she transferred to Dallas, and that's what started my career up here in Dallas. And, and that's a whole faith-based thing as well, because even that... Um, and I hope you don't mind me just rambling on there, but I think it's important because the reason I'm in Dallas is because of a prophetic word. And uh, I was given a prophetic word from a lady in San Antonio who was, we, I called mom, and she has since passed away, um, uh, or with the Lord now, I should say. Um, but she had given me a prophetic word, and, and I even talk about making sure you keep your faith in your life. My agent uh, at the time, who was... Uh, um, negotiating with these teams, I got a, I was told probably about a year and a half or so before I got the call, there'll be two teams. The first team is where the, the, the Lord put his finger on. The second team, you have to wait for it to show you that you have faith in him. And then um, you're going to have to go back to the first team and that's who you're going to sign with. And that's where the hand of the Lord is on for you. But okay, I can listen, right? And I'm like, all right, well, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm playing wherever I can. And then all of a sudden I do get an offer from uh, the Dallas Cowboys wasn't right away. It wasn't for any money up front. And I'm like, but it was just like, move up now. We'll give you a little bit of money to move and we'll start paying you to work out. I was like, okay, let's go. It's, it's a check. Yeah, it's better than nothing. Yes. And um, especially Dallas Cowboys, you know. And, and uh, it was literally the weekend I worked out was the weekend that they fired um, uh, uh, 
Oklahoma. Spitz, uh, Spritzer, um, right? Barry. Barry Switzer, right, Switzer. And I'm um, sorry. And then, um, but I did, you know, of course I didn't come and work out yet, but I worked out and then they didn't offer me right away. And so then I, all of a sudden I get a, um, they, they did give me an offer, but then I was on my way out to, because of my agent at the time, sent me out to Seattle, because Seattle called. So I go out to Seattle, I work out, immediately they offer me a contract, and they were gonna give me 35 grand. Back at the time, that was not bad at all. They were gonna give me 35,000 up front. So my agent's like, all right, we're going, to, we're going to Seattle. I said, you got some money up front, that'd be good. And start, he goes, when you wanna, you know, let's, let's sign with them. I said, no. Nah. I gotta go with the Cowboys. He goes, what, are you crazy? You got money up front here, you can go there. They, they believe in you, they're investing in you. I said, he goes, Cowboys don't believe in you, they're not investing in you. I said, but that's what the Lord said me, told me to go. He goes, what? <laughs> so I go to the Cowboys, I end up you know, uh, playing a little bit left guard, a little bit right guard, and then halfway through the season, Clay Shiver, the center, gets hurt, and I go in and I never give up the, fr- the, the starting position. So I start at center, and at the end of the season, um, one of the coaches comes up to me and he says, hey, congratulations. And I was like, what's that? He goes, you played more than 50% of the plays. I go, yeah, okay. He goes, here, it's a check for $35,000. So God is faithful. I'm telling you right now, God is faithful. So he gave you your signing bonus after you proved it instead of before. Exactly. And, yes. um, and of course, in, uh, now in 99, that was 1998. In 99, um, um, I was going in as a as a starting center, but they had an opportunity to bring Stepnoski back, who was, in, of course, a perennial all-pro uh, at center, and they brought him back and moved me to right guard, and then I blew my knee out uh, early on in the season, and uh, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, it's over. My wife's pregnant with our first do- with our only daughter, right? And, um, and I'm just like, what the heck is life gonna happen? And, and you know what? You stay strong, you stay faithful, and you just trust the Lord and everything, and it's amazing the things that can happen. So, a lot of people, especially young guys, mm-hmm. they feel like, and just this weekend, I've got some some good B-roll footage from this from this last weekend. You were out with a bunch of guys who are uh, sizable, right? yes. and when I say sizable, it's amazing to me. And and you guys are watching; you'll see some of the some of the photos. You were out with some guys that made you look like a small guy. I love it. I absolutely love being next to some of those large human beings. And uh, and they're they're in the in the in the words of our great leader, they were huge. They were huge. <laughs> so the question though is, a lot of those guys feel like, man, if I if I get past this tryout, if I get past this combat, if I get picked up by an agent, if I get picked up by a by a scout man, uh, the world is my oyster. My my paycheck's going to be solid. My my future is going to be rock solid. I, I'm going to be good to go. Now I've had conversations with other mm-hmm. uh, guys who played in the NFL, and many of them say NFL stands for not for long. Yes. And so for a lot of people, they feel like I have arrived right. when they get into their D1 college, or I have arrived when they reach that the offer from the NFL, whether it's enormous or it's not, whether they get the lifetime contract as a, a signature player right. uh, like Zeke, Zeke Elliott or something like that or not, they feel like I've made it. I, I am who I am because of this. My question is, after your journey through, because mm-hmm. I'm guessing there were a lot of moments when you felt like if I could just get this contract, if I could just get hired by that team, if I could just you know get on with the Chiefs, get on with the Cowboys, get on with the Steelers, whoever it is, right. That, that, I, that I'd be on my way. As you look back now, what would your words be to those guys who are coming out of high school, coming out of college going, I know I've arrived, my life is, I am who I am when? Stepping stones. I look at all those lessons in life as stepping stones. Faith builders, hope builders, life builders. Accomplishments are nothing but a stone that is, you step up a little higher and you realize who you really are as a human, as a person, and what you're supposed to do. Yes, you're given a platform. In fact, this weekend there was a little over 300, 330 people, uh, kids that were coming in to try out. We had about 45 offensive linemen, 
and they were huge men. They were huge men, and they're, but they were young, and they were puppies. I look at them yeah. as puppies, and I'm talking to them like this, and they're <laughs> six foot nine, three hundred and fifty pounds, and I'm talking There's to them like some that. Some big dudes out there. Yes, and in fact, one time I was taking a video of two guys battling each other. I go, I'm sending this off to Natural National Ge Geographic to figure out what animals these are, <laughs> you know. And uh, uh, I thought the dinosaurs were dead, but. Uh, I had fun, I, as you, you probably were out, watching me out there, I do have fun out there and I enjoy working with these guys, but I also tell them to relax. Guys, this is a portion of your life where whatever your message is, whatever your uh, calling is, and, and whatever platform you want to use, this is another area that will give you a platform. Right now you have a stage and you have a platform that you can speak on. By coming into the NFL, your platform will grow bigger, so don't worry about don't worry about what's happening anywhere else. When you go click, click with that helmet and you're on that field, forget about everything else behind you and concentrate on getting that job right now. Because if you get this job, when you get this job, whether it be now or like me, that starting position came to me seven and a half years after I kept the quest to go get it. Into the and NFL. how many guys gave up along the way? Exactly, exactly. Uh, there was an article, I was a 31-year-old starter first start in the NFL, you know? Wow. I mean, I remember some of those articles and it's moments and times, and that could have been a moment in time. And I was gonna be a moment in time with these guys and I tell them I'm their best friend. I'm gonna tell them when they mess up and, and I'm, I'm gonna tell them when they do great. And, but I promise you, if anyone jumps in and tries to correct you and I know you're not, it wasn't your fault, and it happened a couple times out there with other coaches, I will jump in their face for you because I'm here to battle for you and it's not your fault because my job is to get you into the NFL or into the CFL, or into another league to, in, to, in, to, to um, continue your um, journey, really. And it's your journey so that you can have that platform, whatever it may be, to be able to do. Now, you have to ask yourself when you look in the mirror, did I give enough today, or am I giving enough today if I'm on the field um, in order for a team to look at me and pay me a half a million dollars? Because next year, 2020, it's going to be over a half a million dollars, being five, ten, five hundred twelve thousand for a rookie, walking off, not drafted. The minimum salary for a rookie next year will be over five hundred thousand wow. dollars. So, are you going to look in the mirror and say, "I did enough work today to deserve a half a million dollars"? That's up to you, but that's the decision that they're making on you. So, you better play well, and and that's how I look at. You know, I, I thought about that the other day and. I was sitting there talking to my brother Dave, and um, I started thinking about, you know, in life, am I doing enough today to deserve what the Lord gave me already? And yeah, it's Are not. Are you being a steward of what's been entrusted right. to you? Exactly. Yeah. Your platform, your ability to reach others, your ability to, to share your hardest moments in life, to share that with people. Some people don't want to talk about the hard moment. Oh, you keep talking about it, it'll come back to you. No. My testimony is be able to talk to those people and let them and let them learn from my mistakes and then to continue to talk about it so that you can help others but also continue to help yourself move on through it and and be able to learn from lessons i mean it's a learned behavior life and that's what god gave us i mean the the lesson of him on the cross and i love when sit there, when people sit there going oh my gosh i don't know if i'm going to overcome this i don't i said what did jesus not do on the cross that wasn't good enough that you, he gave you, he didn't give you, um, oh, you're saved now, but do this. Oh, now, but you got to do this. Oh, but do this. He loves you how you are, and I promise you, you surround yourself with the right people, and you won't be taking a trip around that uh, life called the, the, uh, the mountain again the mountain, and yeah. again and again called life, and your path will get a lot straighter if you live that way, but he still loves you, and he's never leaving you. And that's one thing I've realized through all the, um, all the uh, ups and downs of my life. And I, I've made some knucklehead choices and it was based off of what I thought was good information but ended up not being. And then when you fall back and you fall back to that very foundation that hopefully your parents or somehow you got built in your life and the cornerstone being Jesus Christ, that's the key that I think is a success for all these motivational speakers and all that stuff like that. It's the foundation of life is that is Jesus Christ, and, and that's what helps me um, live my life through all the ups and downs. No matter what's coming at me, I still trust them. So these guys that are thinking my life is going to be arrived when I get that contract, 
you know, rude awakening. Because you're going you're gonna to clap your hands, you're going to turn around, and then you're going to realize for the next 60 minutes, I've got to fight this large, other large human and, tr and keep my... Because you're only as good as your last play. See, Jesus says we're good all the time. Right? As good as your last play, your last moment, your last game. Right. But it really does come down to a play. I mean, it, right. it's microcosmic. Exactly. And life, to me, football, this is what I love about football. It is life. How many times you sit there and you hear that cadence, you snap the ball, and there's six seconds and a cloud of dust. And next thing you know, you got, you got six inches. I was talking to a running back in the back. He's like, man, he goes, I'm, I'm sitting there. I got like a foot. You know, I got two yards. I got three yards. I got negative one yard. I said, but then you get a 40 yarder. Yeah. And that's life. It's, you just got to get up and go. Next, next, you don't win the game. But the, the first 40 snap. yarders don't usually follow other 40 yarders. No. They follow the negative, the one, the right. one foot, the six inches, yeah. The, yeah. the zero. The drop pass, the drop, the, the, the bad throw. Then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, he stove pipes it right in the end zone. He catches it. I mean, it's, it's an unbelievable um, um, event when you're sitting there and you're battling on the field. You're doing everything you can and hoping your team behind you is doing everything that they're supposed to do. And then all of a sudden, shoo, the ball goes in the air. You see it. You see the receiver catch it. And there's nothing more beautiful than seeing a gazelle like Michael Irvin running down the field, choom, into the end zone, and it's a touchdown. And you got to run down there and do the PAT for the snap for the extra extra point. And you're like, yes, and you win the game. Um, I talk about short breaths a lot of times, you know, at the bottom of a pile. And um, I talk about, you know, uh, I describe a, a situation where we had like five seconds left on the clock. We were down by five points and we're on the half yard line. And next thing you know, it's the, the cadence goes out. You snap the ball. There's six seconds of, and then you find yourself at the bottom of the pile. And I, I describe that. Okay, that's right there. And I said, freeze that. How many of you people felt that way at the bottom of a pile in a relationship? How many of the people that you felt that in the in the in this weekend when these guys are like, man, no 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 scouts. We had 130 scouts there. No scouts out of these 130 have called me to do an interview with them, um, uh, or haven't called me yet, or whatever. Uh, I, I I I missed that block and they got a sack. I missed that block and we, they made a, a tackle for a loss. Oh, I looked horrible, you know. Or I did this or I did that. You know, how many times you feel like you just can't breathe? But you just got to remember this: if you do everything, if you study the word. And you do everything, you know, as best as you can, kind of like breaking a, a uh, uh, perfume over Jesus' feet and then wiping his feet, cleaning his feet with that beautiful perfume. So he said what? She did what she could with what she had and she will be blessed and talked about forever, right? That's the definition of excellence, not perfection. And then do the very best you can with what you have. Right. There's a big difference between excellence and perfection. Absolutely. Perfection, success, is an ongoing achievement. Whereas excellence is, I'm going to be the, the best I can today at this moment right now. I'm going to do everything it I really can. It really is living in the short breaths. Yeah, the short breaths, right. And uh, that's why a lot of times when I go speak at different places, I, I love my discussion on short breaths because sometimes it's a short breath of my kids are, you know, kind of going wayward, you know, or my career has come, my to, career an has come to an end. Or, I'm, oh, you know, what happened? I just, I'm excited. I just, you know, we finally got pregnant. Okay, or we're trying, and then you, oh, you're waiting for that short breath of moment while you're waiting to see if, you're, if you are pregnant. And then you are pregnant, guess what? More short breath. We scored. <laughs> we scored. But get this, we scored, okay, in that game. We scored. But I was at the bottom of the pile. I heard the roar of the crowd. It was crazy. Everyone was, yeah, you hear the crowd? But I still couldn't breathe. I did everything I could, but I had three 300-pounders on my back. And my face is jammed in the ground. Nate Newton's face is jammed in the ground. And we're looking at each other, and we're celebrating but we're still trying to take a short breath because we got to peel the guys off of us. So sometimes you may get the contract. You may get pregnant, but you take nine months to have the baby. You get the contract, but you still got to build the building. You may get the contract, but you still got to go through funding. Right. There's whatever it is. You get the contract, and you got to still go do the training sessions. Right. You know? It's still, you celebrate because you got it. Now I got to go work. Now I got to turn around that first, in the beginning of that game, okay, was my first start in the NFL. And I'm sitting there, I get in the huddle, I hear, you know, the, 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 I did the interviews with Madden and, and, and Pat Summerall, the, the announcers at the time, which were incredible, huge guys. And oh, it was just so cool to be able to sit there in this room, and much like this, and being interviewed by them. They're asking about my family and the stories and things like that. And then you go in and, and you, um, 
get announced and you go out there a field and you look at and you I, I got Troy Aikman, I got Emmett Smith. I'm in the huddle. This is split seconds, but I'm looking. Daryl Johnson, Troy Aikman, Emmett Smith, Michael Irvin, um, uh, uh, Larry Allen, Big Big E, Eric Williams. I mean, I'm looking at all these great players. You know, Rocket Ishmael at times. Um, all these wide receivers that are just known, right? And I'm going. I said to myself, I'm one of the boys. <laughs> And then, like I said, I clapped my hands, I turned around, and I had to fight a large human for the next 60 minutes. And I said, now I'm going to go earn my money. And that's exactly where sometimes in life, you got to realize who you are, what team you're on. Yeah. You know, I know that's one thing. Someone, when you go through a hard time, when someone sits there and says, they say, um, Mike, I don't know why you're not depressed with all the stuff you've been through. I go, I go, but I read the book. I know the end. I know the end. Yeah. I win. No matter what, I win. He's like, whoa, I never thought of it that way. And that's my way. Simple stories like that are how I get to reach out and talk to people. John Maxwell says all the time, usually when he's coming off stage, people will come to him and say, man, I, I, I love the way you communicate with the crowd. I love the way you just kind of own the moment. And, and you've got everybody eating out of the palm of your hand. I want to do what you do. And usually you can tell what's going on in the back of their head as they're thinking, man, look at all the people in the crowd. I know what I paid. They're, he must have made some money doing right. this, right? And so when, when they say that to him, I want to do what you do, he always asks the same question. Are you willing to do what I did? Right. Well, so you good. can do what I do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I look at somebody like you and I, I watched those guys, those young guys. And, you know, I talked about this, in fact, on one of the uh, morning leadership episodes. I saw you out there with your hands just doing this. No ball in your hand, just moving your wrists around. Mm -hmm. And I watched you take a couple of those guys and, and you would tell them, you know, just rotate your hand and show them how the step changes whether or not your forearm hits your knee mm -hmm. on the snap. And I thought, you know, these are guys, these are not guys that, you know, they're in peewee. Right. <laughs> these are not guys that have never seen a football before. Right. They probably snapped that ball two or 300, maybe thousand times right. in between practice and games. And so these are not neophytes with snapping a football, but why in the world would they listen to you snapping a football? And the answer to that question is authority. Mm -hmm. It's authority that's been earned by listening to a coach tell you, stop doing it like that, do it like this and then practicing doing it that way long enough that people look at you and go, he knows what he's doing with the football. Right. You don't become the best in the league anywhere right. unless you've done the right thing enough times. But that usually is preceded by doing the wrong thing several times before you do the right thing a couple of times and then doing the right thing over and over again. That's huge. So now when you go out and talk to these guys, these enormous young men, even if they're bigger, even if they are very accomplished, even if they've won the awards and, and got all the accolades, they look at you as a veteran who's done that thing and your influence and impact in their life are based on the respect they have for your position and your title, but you also carry a sense of authority and it's not just the mm -hmm. physical size, it's, I know what I'm talking about, we don't have to discuss this. Right. Tell me a little bit about some of the first people who spoke into your life with that kind of authority, the, the kind of people that said, you're doing it all wrong, let me show right. you how to do it right. Well, honestly, you have you, you basically have just nailed another one of my speaking points whenever I speak, and you've heard me talk before, um, uh, what a coach is. First of all, be coachable. Absolutely. You always have to be coachable. And I heard that, and, I'll, and his name was Mike Webster. He was a perennial all-pro for the Pittsburgh Steelers, I don't know, four Super Bowl rings and um, three or four Super Bowl rings. And then uh, he was with me in Kansas City. It was my first year out of Maryland. I went to the University of Maryland, came out to Kansas City, signed a, a contract with him, was training with him. And this older guy who was in the league forever was teaching me. He says, always be, uh, be coaching and always be coachable, meaning... Be that middle guy, but you know, by you coaching other people, right? They're, you know, you're lifting them up, as well as when a coach grabs you, because a coach is there for a reason. Here's what it, my, my kiss like ism. I call, I, 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 I created this in my own head, whatever. And it, what a coach is, Co coachism, right? It's a person that sees something in you that you don't see, pushes you beyond where you can go to take you to places you've never been. Okay. That's what it is. That's what a coach is to me. So I look to a coach, especially in the NFL, your colleagues. It's not like in a peewee league or any other league where the coach is up here, what he says goes. This is a collaboration of, two, of someone who's talented physically 
end, men end mentally to a guy who has been through a lot and has a lot of experience that will help you get, make you even better. Mike Webster was a seven-time Pro Bowl, perennial uh, Pro Bowler, who has Super Bowl rings and all the hardware to go with it, is listening, I'm watching him listen to a coach who was not as accomplished as him, but he's like, okay, because the coach is watching film because his job is to make him better. Right. To see the defense better, see this better, see that better. And he coached him. So I'm watching this as a young guy, and I'm like, wow, okay, this guy's listening to him. So that authority that he gave him, I respected and gave to him, right? And, or same thing, I would listen. Well, that's exactly what I tell people. Authority and respect <clears throat> are not the same thing, but they're right. very similar in that both of them are increased when you give them away, mm -hmm. and both of them are built stronger right. when you surrender it to somebody else. So if Absolutely. you are under authority, you're going to grow your authority. If you respect others, you're going to grow your respect. Right. But both of them are passed through. Uh -huh. Or as John Maxwell says, a river, not a reservoir. Oh, gotcha. You don't gain yeah. it and hold on to it. Right. You gain it and give it away. Well, if you gain it and you hold on to it, what are you doing good? Well, it's going to stagnate. It's going to stagnate. <laughs> but you're not doing anything. If you get the platform, if you have a message and you get the platform and you don't use it, it's your fault. Yeah. If you don't use the platform the Lord blessed you with, it's your fault. And he's, he guess what? If you don't use it long enough, he's going to give it to someone else. The opportunities that are there waiting for you have sometimes have a time limit on it. Sometimes they don't. And God will put you, bring you up, or maybe, you know, uh, whatever it could be. It may, oh, you know what? He wasn't ready for that, so I gave that so-and-so. Um, uh, you know, or open the door for him. Um, these people that just believe I, I can create in my mind the opportunity, I can do this, this Jedi stuff. I don't, I mean, I'm all about you align yourself with the Lord. First seek ye the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. If you seek him first, even if you don't know Jesus, but you seek God first, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit's going to enter you and talk to you, and he's going to talk to you about Jesus. And you're like, oh, wait, he gave us his only son, his only begotten son, so that whoever believes in him shall have everlasting life and, not, and will not perish and have everlasting life. So, okay, that's, those are two key scriptures for me. And then you've got to realize, okay, who, this guy was worrying, walking around like a John Randall. Okay, we're talking football. John Randall is a Hall of Famer out of uh, Minnesota, from Texas, poor as, any, poor as poor can be. And then he gets, and he's small, he's short, overcame so much stuff. He ends up becoming a pro bowler with the, uh, um, with the not just a pro bowler, but he also became a Hall of Famer in the NFL when he played with Minnesota. Okay? Yeah. That guy would, he, and I saw him at, um, one, another golf tournament that we did, uh, I think it was Charles Haley's golf tournament, and Charles was, a, of course, now a Hall of Famer as well, Dallas Cowboy, 49er. And, um, and so we're there, and we're talking to him, and I was like, John, because we knew each other. We know defenses. We right. know all the players on defense because you study them over and over <laughs> yes. and over and over, so you know their moves. You know when they twitch. You know, you that, know uh, your enemy. Yeah. Right. And then he knew us. So he knew us so well, John was known for reading everything about you, doing history lesson on you, wow. and then he would talk smack, okay? Just Using your history. Everything, <laughs> every, and nothing was off, nothing was off base when it came to, you know, love and war, right? Yeah. Yeah. In the trenches, he would, because I knew what he was doing. I said, you know what, you're a scripture. I'm gonna call you a scripture, that's what you are, a scripture man. And he's like, what? I go, yeah, you are like the lion walking to and fro, seeking who you shall de devour. I said, because that's exactly what you're doing. You are like the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I said, that's exactly what you are when, when it comes and to the defense. the accuser of the brethren. And all you do is get in someone's head, because if you get in my head and you say something that I don't like, and all of a sudden I start lashing out you with words, I'm going to get out of my physical game. You're going to get me out of my game. I'm not going to remember the play exactly as well. I'm going to want to hurt you more than get my job done. And so I'm going to put more, uh, um, more focus on you than what I'm supposed to do here. He goes, you know my game, <laughs> you know? I said, yeah. I said, because you'd sit there and say something to me, and I'd answer back to you, agreeing with you. Oh, yeah, you know, whatever. And, but then you'd find, once that person answered you back, you stayed on them, and I guarantee you got a sack off of them. He goes, that's my game. Eminem, uh, in the movie Eight Mile, mm -hmm. had exactly the same scenario. Mm -hmm. He knew that the, the guy he was in that rap battle with was going to come at him and attack his where he lived, attack the quality of his family, attack the nature of his mother. I mean, right. the, the whole nine. And he said, I'm, I'm going to disarm him. 
because I'm going to come out with the mic first. Yep. And I'm going to expose all the stuff he thinks is ammunition until we just lay it out there and you got nothing to fight well, with. Well, I love that because that's exactly why I tell my testimony. People are like, why do you want to tell your testimony? Because you know what? I, I love it when people, I, I come up there and I tell people, you want to know about me? Google me. You want to know, me, want to know the truth? Ask me for coffee. So thank you today, everyone listening, for having me for coffee. And, and that's really how I do it. And I will, then on my testimony, I tell all. Right? I tell all, everything. I love telling everything because I know there's people that do Google you and they're over there going, hey, this, 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 this. And, I, and I love to say, okay, come on, I know there's a few of you out there that do. I you know do first, there's yeah. a few people out there that do this. I said, well, guess what? I'm telling the whole story. And it's actually fun for me. And at the end of the day, I get people come up to me all the time and like, man, that was wonderful the way you explained that. And, and that's the truth. I love when people sit, sit me down and have a cup of water, have a cup of coffee, whatever it is. And just break bread, as we used to say up in New York. You know, let's go break some bread, you know, and, and, and get to know each other. And, and this is a moment in time where I'm able to share who I am with your, with your audience and with you. Of course, you know me very well. And, um, and it's exciting. It's exciting to be able to share your testimony, your experiences, your life journey, and through all the ups and downs of life and what st sticking to the game plan uh, is and it's it's either game plans or, or or business plans, right? You know, I always tell people there's always a plan. What's your game plan? My game plan is to, again, I told you half a scripture that John Randall was, but then I also know the person I follow, right, is not that part of the scripture. Now John's not that type of person. He loves the Lord, but I mean he was John ten ten, and it's it's kind of funny his name is John, right? John ten ten is. Oh my gosh, and he went in in 2010, by the way, just saying, um, in the Hall of Fame. But uh, John 10.10 10 is, uh, this, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal everything you got, er, you know, make your reputation bad. He wants to hurt anything you can possibly do to, to that, that will give you that platform to do the next thing. Because Christ comes to give you life and life more abundantly. And that L-Y at the end of it means ongoing. So... Right. That's where I, I, sometimes I may make a knucklehead choice or I may get into a situation and I'm not going to let them steal my joy. So I, I concentrate on Jesus and my relationship and that pushes me through and gets me through those times. It's amazing how, how much, uh, much more disciplined you are and you draw so close. Uh, as God said, the, the first commandment was come nigh to the mountain. And what do they do? Oh, you go, Moses. Yeah. Well, I'm not. I'm, I want to be the Moses. I'm going to go. I'm going to run to him, and I'm going to try to do the best I can to to dive into him and and hear that voice, that still voice in your heart that talks to you and and gives you that joy and, and, and that that keeps you going every day, every day, every day, no matter what you're doing. And you put the work in, the effort in. To me, they say, oh well, you know, you can't earn. You can't earn. You just got to believe. That's what he says. But if you believe, your body automatically changes, and you start doing through your actions instead of your words. Because some people speak so loudly, I can't hear their words. But I, wanna, I want to, uh, I want my action, I'm sorry, their actions speak so loudly I can't hear their words. I want my actions to speak so loudly that they don't need to hear my words. And that's why I Was it involved. Mother Teresa, I think, that said that, the, maybe she said it first, maybe she was quoting somebody from way back when, but she said, you know, I, I just want to, I just want to be delivering the gospel at all times and when necessary use words yeah you know my wife works at baylor and the oncology floor and she loves telling me she goes i just want to be the arms feet and ears of jesus i want to listen to people when they need to be listened to i want to hug them when they need to be hugged and i want to speak to them and and pray for them when i can i'd love to have her on the show because some of the some of the conversations that i have with especially with leaders and mm -hmm. leaders who've been in the limelight uh, you, you forget sometimes the power of the one that stands right behind them. Mm -hmm. You forget the level of leadership influence. You know, I was talking to a guy one time about, uh, about being in leadership, and he said, you know, forget trying to get through the gatekeeper with the CEO. You, know, you, you try to get into Jerry Jones' office, there's 19 layers of people that are there to stop you from right. getting in there. But go play golf with the man, right. and you'll have more influence in his life because of the people who are in that immediate proximity. And spouses, uh, whether it's a pastor's wife or it's a, a, a politician's wife or it's a superstar's wife, they have a level of influence that is off the charts, as they should have. But a lot of times they get overlooked in asking that question. So tell me a little bit about 
the influence. Tell me a little bit about the story. I mean, I'd love to hear this story. Uh, we've talked in the oh, her past. version. She yeah. always has different version of mine. She's, this we've, is his version. We've talked in the past <laughs> about the black helicopters and and what that that dark day was like. Yeah. We've talked about the glory moments on the field. We've mm -hmm. talked about you know influencing and the charity stuff that you do now. Uh, and I want to talk some more about sure. that for the for the sake of those that are watching. But I'd love to hear her take on those moments because it's different, not only for the for the spouse. But your wife is a lot like my wife. She's a little bit quieter. Mm -hmm. uh, physically speaking, she's a little bit smaller. A lot smaller. <laughs> and so this is not the kind of person you expect to be a roaring lion stepping uh -huh. up into that challenge going, stop, right? That, uh -huh. That's not what you expect. But I can tell you from, from observing and hearing other people say, when you get on the bad side of my tiny little wife, uh, you've unleashed a lion and, and you, you better recognize. And if I'm not mistaken, in the jungle, the lioness does the killing. She does the killing, and she and the lion may appear to be in charge, but yeah. she's really running the show. Absolutely, it's so. funny that you said that. It was, it was exactly what I was thinking too, and it's kind of funny. Even, even in my house, we've got a, we've got two dogs. One is a little I call it um, a, uh, a living stuffed animal. Yeah. And and the other one is uh, is a what I call a man dog, a dog that you want around. It's, it's you know, and and he's tough looking. He's kind of looks like a, he's a he's a mix of a bunch of stuff, but he's what they call Dogo Argentino, which has some bull, you know, some type bull looking to him. And he looks, some people think he's a pit bull, and, and it's kind of funny because he's this thing. He'll crawl down to that when he first came. He crawls down and he's like, Rrr, and, you know, and they're talking like that. And then all of a sudden they start getting. She, he goes and grabs a toy, and then she's like, "They're all my toys." So she's like, dup, 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 dup. and we go, "That's Kim and Mike right there. That's Kim and Mike." <laughs> so funny. We have fun with that. It's 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 kind of fun, but. Um, it is so true, you know, and, and uh, I've been very blessed with, uh, uh, with my family. Um, I, I asked for a beautiful woman when I was younger, and I said, Lord, I just want to meet, you know, the perfect wife, and I only want one in 27 years now. Uh, Kim says she doesn't want to end anything because she doesn't want to have to train someone all over again. It's taking a long time. Yep. <laughs> and then my daughter, Michaela, of course. Um, uh, again, a prophetic word prior to us having her, uh, and we named her Michaela, Michaela Grace Kislak. Okay, of course, her, we named her Michaela because we thought it was Michael at first, and we found it was Michaela. I didn't want to name her Michaela because I wanted to have another child. I thought we were going to have another child, and I wanted to name him Michael, and I wanted to call him Michael John Kislak II, and I wanted to call him Deuce. That was my plan. <laughs> that was my plan, all right? And... Uh, uh, next Did you, you know, to hear God laugh when you told him your plan? We, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I think he laughed through my wife because my wife says, no, we're calling her Michaela. <laughs> and we're going to, is M-I-C, not with a K, because her name is Kimberly Christine Kislak, right? So I'm like, okay. So Michaela with a C. Michaela, and then I said, well, what's your middle name again? Somehow, I, I don't exactly remember how we came up with Grace, but because Michaela and Michael mean from God or of God, there's different versions, but from God. Grace, I said, oh, that's perfect because all the knucklehead decisions I've made in my past, <laughs> I said, that's from God's grace, half you, half you, half me, half you, all God, right? And when we found out seven and a half years after we were married, because we kept trying and we couldn't have a child, and we were told we probably weren't going to be able to have a child, all of a sudden we get blessed. We started looking for um, to adopt, and next thing you know, boom, we get pregnant. And I promise you, anybody who's not been pregnant yet, it is a we get pregnant. <laughs> and um, your life changes as exactly. much. Yeah. And, um, and then, then we, so uh, I'm sitting there years later, maybe nine years later, when she, she's nine years old, and I'm in a Bible study in South Lake with um, a bunch of guys. And um, every Saturday morning, all of a sudden, they're starting talking about na means, meaning of names, right? And all of a sudden, someone comes across the word grace, and they're like, yeah, that's the word, that's the John. John means grace. I go, what? I'm, and I'm, people like turn around to the Bible study, what? I go, oh my gosh, she's my deuce. Because get this, in volleyball, when she played volleyball, guess what her number was? Two. I was the idiot up in the corner, way up there and high, you know, and, and all the people are yelling, cheering the kids. And when Michaela got up there getting ready to, to hit the ball, I'd be, deuce. And that's, it just reverberated off the ceiling and stuff. And they're like, there's your dad. And I'm the one who created all names for all the girls to make them know that I was thinking of them and stuff. And it was great. And, um, and so I was calling her Deuce when she was playing. And it was kind of funny how the Lord sometimes gives you your heart's desire and you don't even know it. It didn't look like what you thought it was going to. No, she's not prettier than what a guy would look like. 
<laughs> and she's got a heart. I love it. Who's, who's 19, 20 years old? Most kids, when they go to college, they don't text you and say, hey, we think we found our church. <laughs> You know, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. That's, that's what you want. And then she sends scriptures to us when you, she knows you're going through a hard time or something's happening. She'll send you scripture. Where's she going to school? She goes to Arkansas. And uh, she's her second year there, and she loves it up in uh, Fayetteville. Yeah. So, But um, I know you want you had a couple other things. I, I ramble sometimes, no, so no, I apologize. No, no, that's good. Yeah, so one of the things that really fascinates me, again, back to this, this five-foot balance wheel, authority to respect to influence, to impact. Um, tell me about some of the things that you're doing that because of the platform that was created for you, having the opportunity to play in the NFL, you've had a, a chance to participate in. Now, the ones that I know of mm -hmm. are, I know you do some golf tournaments. I don't know much about that. I've never played, a, I've played half a round of golf once right. in my life besides putt-putt. Um, I know you do the Spokes for Hope. Right. I know you participate with Kids Matter, or, or mm -hmm. that's where one of the places that we first started working together. Right, right. And uh, the, so, what else do you do? Well, what it is is when I have to those, make an impact. When I when I, I I try to make an impact in all that. I, even this weekend, it was it was pretty much a charity thing for me. Um, I do it five days a week, five days, one day, one once a year. Okay, it's a it's a camp for the NFL guys, and I wanted to make an impact in their lives to help them understand the the position that they have and what they're able to do. Um, everything that I do, whether it be business, uh, whether it be a, I have a construction company as well, whenever I'm doing someone's house, I want them to know I'm going to do the best I can, you know, and I'm going to fight for them with their insurance company or whoever to make sure we get the right product on their roof and, the, and they get made whole. Uh, whether it be in a consulting deal that I'm doing uh, with projects, and I make sure we put the right team together. I believe in making a, the right roster of professionals around you. The Bible says to surround yourself with wise counsel. And, and I've learned that the hard way, to be honest with you. I've learned that. And um, uh, sometimes I didn't do that. And that's where it's, I call my knucklehead decisions. But um, uh, then, the, of course, all the different... I, I don't think charity helping, you know, uh, the children of un unfortunate, um, uh, less fortunate children or underserved children um, are... Um, it's their fault where they're at. Right. I don't think... Jesus on the cross didn't forget about them, but he put me here. So if I see an opportunity where I can help, why aren't we doing it? And let's figure out how we can. And I might not be able to do it all, but I can throw a couple of those starfish back, right. you know, and, and, and give them a new life. And so if I can help them by buying clothes with Kids Matter, we, I've been doing that. Uh, well, actually, I started before them. We started in 1998 at a church over in Carrollton. We started buying clothes, uh, $100 a kid, took them clothes in, in 1998. My daughter wasn't even born yet. Um, and then uh, my wife and I started doing that. It was with the Cowboys. It was great. You know, I just I was felt proud because I was a Dallas Cowboy. And next thing you know, I'm clothing these kids in the early morning, and this is how it got me. I'm sitting there, and I see this little girl come out. I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm handing donuts out and, and, and hot chocolate to these kids waiting in line to get with this. I, I consider they see this angelic figure coming to them because they're going to take them into this store and they're going to get brand new clothes. And I was like, this is awesome. But then I, I, I got hooked when this little girl comes out. She had a little blonde curly hair and she had you know a little hoodie with her hood down and she looks at her dad with only a way a little girl can look at her dad. And he goes, and he just gives her, and I was just kind of observing from afar and he, he gives her the, the, the old... So she digs into her bag, pulls out this blue princess dress, pulls it over her, puts her hoodie back on, pulls it over herself, puts the hoodie back down, and it was flurrying. We don't get that much in Texas, but it was, right. so it was cold, okay? She pulls that dress over top, and she sticks her tongue out, and she looks up to the sky, and she starts swir uh, swirling around in her, in her, on her feet, just like she was a princess in the middle of her wonderland, right? Wow. And she's like or her kingdom, you might say. And she's got her tongue out catching flurries, right? And I'm going, oh, I'm going to do this. I didn't know I was going to be doing it over 20 years, right? Because it's, what, 2020 coming up? I mean, or we're in 2020 now, but we're at the end of the, we usually do it in November, October, November, December. And, um, and then in 2006, um, I was with Kids Matter, and they were, I said, man, if you want me to be on the board, just you got to look at this. And they were... 50 kids they had to send home because we, we were down and they didn't, we didn't have enough money. And so I was like, wait a second, you sent them home? Go get them. We'll get them right now. We'll write a check for five grand. We'll, we'll get them taken care of. We'll figure, I'll figure it out. 
And they were like, well, we already sent them. Just, I said, no, okay, well, you call them, let them know we're gonna call them back. And so the next night, I went to this, at the Kids Matter International board meeting, or not board meeting, they had a gala, or their, their annual um, event that they have. And I wasn't on the board yet. And they, um, in fact, they weren't even called Kids Matter yet. And, because uh, they changed that name. Uh, we went, and, I'm, and they said, well, we want you on the board. I said, well, um, Kevin was with me, one of the board members. And he's like, he goes, I gotta have a, a, a conversation with the board. He went over there with the board, comes back, he, they, all of them, there was only like five or six of them, they said, or seven of them, I think, and they said, you got your five grand. I said, no, I don't want just a five grand. I said, I want your time. Next weekend, when we get these, or whenever we can get them round up, I think it was literally the next weekend, I said, bring the five grand, and um, I want the board members and their wives to come and shop with these kids. I did that. They were hooked like I was hooked that first day. And ever since then, Kids Matter in 2006 took it over to help. 2006, 2007, we partnered with them. 2008, we went on our own because they kind of just, it was, you know, egos hit both yeah. sides. I was in, in the middle of it. And, um, and we ended up just saying, okay, well, we're going to continue doing it. And we kept doing it. So this year, we did over, uh, I think may have been over, but I know we did at least 2,000 kids. Well, and you did it in multiple different places, too, Yeah, right? we because we realize our, 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 our um, sweet spot is between 500 and 700 kids in one spot at a time. Because if you go more than that, there are no more clothes left, and it's just, right. it just takes too long. But we it did. It chaos. We did, um, we did it one, two, three. One, a location in North Dallas near the airport, one location down by in Arlington, and then another location in um, Austin and the Kohl's department store. They've oh, wow. become our partners. And this way, it's... It's just been a blessing to be able to, thousands of kids over the years, we've been able to clothe and give them brand new clothes, $100 worth, and, and it's been a blessing. And we've got so many people that pour into that now. On the other hand, Spokes for Hope, which is, um, started out with uh, a police officer and another guy, and, and it, it was really to help those, to, I look at it this way, and I, I liked it because I was helping kids early on, but I realized why I was doing it now is because you see whether it be on sports or anywhere else, you see guys protest. I don't protest, I find solutions. And this is a solution to me to help blur that blue line that so many kids see uh, that are especially inner city or underserved areas where they may come in and get their parents, you know, um, for drug possession or whatever it's happening, whatever, right. whatever it is. They don't look at police officers the same way I look at police officers. And police officers are there to protect and serve and sometimes they got to go arrest bad people. Well, and on both sides of that, they both need to see the other person as human. Exactly. And it's so easy to get caught up in, you know, this right. is my job, this is my role, I, I have an assignment, right. and forget that the person on the other side may be having a bad day, maybe made a mistake, maybe whatever, right. but suddenly it's a, a life tragedy, right. and, you know, it, it can be a really bad thing. And I'm going to have you interview um, um, Alton Wells. Okay. He's the one who started it. And he tells a story that only he can tell, but I'll give you a little quick synopsis of it. It was a guy who was, he goes, Mr. Mr. Wells, and he'll cry when he tells, tells it too. He goes, uh, Officer Wells, he goes, do you remember me? He goes, um, uh, he's a big old, old, old uh, what does he look like? The Marlboro Man, right? It looks what he looks <laughs> like, you know? And he used to ride a motorcycle around South Lake and stuff, and he's like, um, he's like, no, 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 son, I, I, don't, I don't recall. And he goes, um, he goes, no, you don't remember? He goes, um, did I write you a ticket? Or, I mean, how do I, how would I know you? He goes, well, um, do you know so-and-so and so-and-so? He named his parents. He goes, son, I, I, don't, I don't recall. He goes, I'm sorry. You know, and he's super apologetic about it. And he goes, well, my parents were sick. And they let you guys know, Spokes for Hope, they let you guys know what happened to me. They were sick. I quit school to go work at like Best Buy or something like that and my bike got stolen while I was working at Best Buy. He goes, and before I got off, um, an officer who took that called you and you brought a bike to me. When I came out, I had a brand new bike and that was the first time anyone ever really got me anything and showed that they loved me and cared about me and I looked up to you and wanted to be just like you. And he goes, I just got back and I got to leave again. I'm being, what is it when they leave um, for military? They, deployed. They, get, they got employed, deployed. Deployed. Got deployed again. And this kid said, he goes, um, I just want to let you know I'm a Navy SEAL. 
I got chills even now <laughs> thinking about it. And he and I and then he just will sit there and cry. And it's that's the heart. That's you know that's that one kid you talk about impact. Yeah, absolutely. That's an impact. And who do we know? How many out of these thousands of kids that we clothed, that we gave them, we functioned them, or functioned them, we supported them, and and gave gave them enough. Um, what do you call it? Um, a self pride uh, in who they are with their clothes that they're wearing. You yeah. know, because they don't have to worry about dirty clothes. They don't have to go to the thrift store to go get. I, I mean, I'll go to the thrift store and get some clothes, but not because I have to. It's because I'm looking for a good deal and something I don't right. know if I want or not yet. You know, yeah. something cool. But they they go because they have to. Well, guess what? How nice is it to go and actually take the the tag off and the the plastic off and put something brand new on? Well, and sometimes there's a there's a gap. One of the things that fascinated me that I saw with the Kids Matter was that uh, these are not people who are you know necessarily living on food stamps and and you know they're they're at the bottom in poverty and and the projects, but they're in that gap between everything is fine, we're all good, we got a little extra in the bank, et cetera, et cetera, and we're living on everything handout. Right. And somewhere in the middle is kind of where I grew up. I mean, mm -hmm. we did live on food stamps and potato soup, but mm -hmm. I was the only son of a single mom. We, we never had extra money. There were right. four of us or three of us at, at home. And and watching that whole cycle, she worked sometimes literally 24 hours a day, 24 to 48 hour stretches, right. and, and didn't even come home. So to know what it's like to be in that position to say, you know, we can keep the lights on, we can keep the bills paid, but new clothes are not happening you know and we're not talking about being so broke that we have to have right handouts but it, from time to time a little extra something is right. nice and and i'll tell you that there's a dichotomy in me that i love to give i'm just always right on that margin of you know if i give then i'm going without and right. and that's become a discipline for me but it makes it even hard to receive sometimes you're exactly right and you and, do give a lot and there are people who've you know i had a guy just recently say I've got this cash in an envelope, and he said, I, I want to give it to you and your wife. And I'm like, well, we're not in any need right now. He said, I didn't ask if you were in need. I, I had the extra cash, and I prayed about it, and God said I was supposed to give it to you. I said, well, let me talk to my wife about it. Let me pray about it, because uh, I'm not even sure if I'm supposed to receive it. And when I prayed, what God said was, how dare you rob him of the blessing? That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. That's what I was going to say, because so, you know when I give people, and people say no? I said, don't steal my blessing. So we put it back in an envelope <laughs> and, and my wife carried it around for a couple of weeks and then, you know, opportunities came up and we're like, well, we've got one car that's in the shop, one that needs to go in the shop. It's not enough to fix either one of them, but, you know, we'll, we'll give it a shot. And then it was about that time I got laid, laid it on my heart to do these interviews. And I said, you know, I, I don't have everything I need to be able to do that at the highest level. Uh -huh. And so I went back to the guy and I'm like, you know, I, here's what I feel like I'm supposed to do with the money. He said, I don't care what you do with the money, but I love the idea. So you know, there was an endorsement of the idea, not necessarily an endorsement of, of, of the spending of the money, but it, it was hard for me to say, you know, I'll receive that gift. It is hard. Because it, you know, I go back to the days, like you said, you know, I, I want to earn the blessings or at least be a good steward of the blessings that God's given me. So whatever talent, whatever opportunity he's put in my hand, whatever business opportunity that he's put in my hand, I want to make sure that I'm quote, worthy of it. And there's a, there's a challenge, and, and this leads to the let you know, First of all, you're not worthy of it. And, You're not worried. That's exactly right. And that's the transformation that we have to we have to go through. The impact that we make in other people's lives mm -hmm. and the impact that others make in our life, a lot of times is driven by the fact that we feel like we've got to earn acceptance. We've got to earn relationship. We've got to earn the right. We've got to earn the authority, earn the respect. And so all of this kind of comes full circle when we realize there's a place where grace says you couldn't have been good enough. Right. Everything you've done... As I think he, the word he used was filthy rags. Right. The, the very best you have is not good enough. Right. But I covered the gap, and that's called grace. But that doesn't absolve you, absolve you from the responsibility to continue to do the best you have with what, what I've given you. Right. I mean, the, seven, the ten talents versus the one. If you don't do anything with what I gave you, I'm going to take it away. But if you do everything you can with what you have, I'm going to continue to give you more. Right. When we talk about transformation, what <clears throat> you've talked about your transformation watching the little girl in her princess dress, and Alton's transformation, mm -hmm. you know, having the conversation with the, the Navy SEAL. What do you think has been the greatest transformation you've seen in someone else uh, because of the 
cycle in your life, the authority, the respect, the influence, using that platform, the impact that you've had on your life, the, the transformation you've been able to look at and say, I was a part of that, and I'm, I'm honored to say I was a part of that. Well, anyone who has a child, yes, you see a young human first, and then all of a sudden they start talking and crawling and doing things, looking at you, and actually, first of all, you see this young little beautiful child that can't function anything, right? Right, totally dependent. And then all of a sudden they start becoming aware. And then they start crawling. And then they start, you know, saying noises, what I call speaking in tongues, right? <laughs> and then they, they um, start doing more. And then through every part of their life, and, and I talk about, man, I miss when she was young, but I love where she's at right now. I miss when she was at this level, but now I miss where, I'm, I'm so happy. Even now where she's in college, Man, I, she's like my best friend, you know? And, and I love seeing her experience life and be able to share, knowing that we did the best we could to give her a foundation. And when the compliments come in from people, your, what, your daughter is this, your daughter, oh, she's wonderful, this. Oh, uh, you know, I want, didn't want to let them go, but if I heard your daughter was going with them, <clears throat> I said, oh, okay, then you can go and stuff. You hear stuff like that, and you're like, you know, Kim, we did something right. All of a sudden your heart feels like a mylar balloon. We did, we did something right. And I remember one time where I sat there, because I would not let her date until she was 16, right? And there were some boys, you know, that were out the door, and I'm like, no. You know, and she's like, but dad, but dad, but the old but dad, right? I'm like, no. It wasn't that many, but it was a few. And not like, I said, no dating. She did go on two dates. One was a, you know, it's kind of funny, as a young kid, they go to a, a what is it? A football game, uh, what do they call it? homecoming? So he went to one homecoming, and it was kind of funny. Um, and then the, she went on one Valentine's date, and she was so nervous, it was so funny. And that was it. And then at 16, you know, I said, Well, you know what? I do notice there's just one boy has been hanging around a lot longer in his group dating stuff, and you can come over to the house if you can go somewhere, but there better be five, seven, nine. You know, not exactly. There's not. <laughs> there better be an odd number. You know, yeah. and um, and uh, 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 and she was just like, no, no, Dad, we're just hanging out. We're just talking. There's so many levels now. I don't even know what they're called. Right? We're talking. We're hanging out. We're just whatever friends or whatever. And um, and I was no. I noticed he's been around. No, 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 Dad. It's okay. I said, man, it's two weeks before his 16th birthday. I'm not going to be that dad. That's that all all the way up to the date. If he wants to date you. I like him. I already checked him out, by the way, and um, <laughs> and uh, uh, met, you know heard about his parents, you know through a friend of mine who coached him when he was younger. He's a baseball player, and uh, um, uh, super great family, uh, wonderful family, wonderful kid, and heard nothing but good things about him. And I was like, right. And uh, so I said, you, you know what? It's two weeks to your birthday. If you know if he really wants to date you, I'm okay with it. Right, already had the discussion at the house. Talked to him a little bit. That's a whole nother interview, and um, and it's funny because um, she looks at me. She's like, "No, Dad, it's okay. We're, we're, no, it just tells me you care. I promise you, I'm a 300 pound man." I turned around, walked away, and cried because I said, "I literally said I did something right," <laughs> and I was so happy about that. And she literally said that now. Right after her, her birthday, she did end up starting dating him, and guess who the person she is? And I did pray for this one. When, when she was still in the womb, when Kim was pregnant, every night I would lay hands on Kim, on her, on her belly, and I would just pray. I don't know what I was praying. Sometimes I would speak in tongues. Sometimes I just pray, perfect feet, perfect eyes, perfect sight, perfect this, perfect that, and I would proclaim these things over her. And then I would say, the, the perfect husband, the perfect boyfriend, the perfect, and I didn't know they were all gonna be the same. I hope they are anyway. But, um, and I, she's only had one boyfriend. Wow. She's only been dating, she's been dating him for four years now. She's almost 20, she will be in, in February. And uh, uh, God is so good, you know? And, he, and they both are so mature. And like, you know, I remember when I was a kid and I was dating someone, I was like, I'd be around her all the time or she'd be around me all the time. And I would like, they come home from college, they could both go to Arkansas, and I was like, "Where's, where's, where's, where's he at? You know, where's Cole?" And uh, and and she's like, "Well, he's with his friends tonight." I was like, "What are you gonna do? I'm just gonna hang out with you guys." And I'm just like, "You're so mature. I love you so much. 
I'm gonna cry again, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> it's so funny, but it's it's and Kim loves him too, and and it's been a a blast, and and I pray that it stays together, and um, uh, there, it's, there's just how God will answer your prayers in ways you had no idea, and will answer those things that you prayed before she was even born, and you're yeah. seeing them come to fruition now, and and even um, um, you know looking at the. Uh, the scriptures and stuff over and over how they reach out to you the devotionals that she sends to me or I send to her and and how they you know we we get to talk about those things and it's just wonderful so the impact the transformation to see a child grow through life and even now I'm like the transformation I remember when they were dating he was over there because he's a year older he was in Arkansas she was in South Lake and I was like oh boy here we go you know Oh, they stayed together. Okay, and then next, okay, first year back, and they were up in you know Arkansas together. I'm like, okay, nope, still together. Now I was like, okay, well, let's see the second this year. This might be a thing. This might be a, this might be a thing, you know. <laughs> and um, and um, I'm so blessed that they and they both. I mean, shoot, there's times where like, I'm like, uh, I'm not gonna go to church today. Yeah, well, I want to go. Okay, then I'll go. You know, and it's just wonderful how um, you see. Parts of yourself, parts of your wife, but again, I always look at her and I go, half mom, half me, all God. Yeah. You know, so uh, God is so good. He's been blessed me so much in so many different ways. Seeing even my own transformation from when I first didn't even know the Lord, right? And I remember telling my wife at one point in time, I'm no Bible thumper, I'm no Jesus freak. Who would have known I am? And uh, just didn't come out in you yet. It, I was, exactly, it was being kind of like birthed. Being a center. It was being birthed, yeah. right? Exactly. And it's just amazing how um, how life teaches you lessons. Sports is so much like life, and then business. If you put it all together, it's it really is. Uh, that's why I'm such a proponent for sports. I'm not yeah. talking video game sports. I'm talking sports. I'm talking, you know, teammates. I'm talking uh, uh, fighting through adversity. I'm talking uh, get, overcoming uh, a loss and having a win the next year or having such a horrible team for two, three years sometimes and finally reaching a part where you're winning games and, and then finally one of those teams, one of those many years you may have that one opportunity, whatever league, whatever level you're at, to win a championship. It's something about that that just means so much because you work so hard you know it's not easy to happen. Right. And um, as Christians, I think sometimes we, um, we look past that because we were given something. And that you, you were talking about do to get. Yeah. And that's exactly, I get into that because, you know, if you work out harder, you usually get stronger. If you eat the right way, you're going to do this. You do this, you're going to you sleep better, you're going to do this. Results oriented. Results oriented. I, I'm a, I'm a fix-it guy. I've learned, even with my wife, I just got to listen. Because when she, <laughs> ha halfway through it, I, go, oh, I can go fix that right now. She's like, I don't want you to fix it. Well, you know what you should have said? No, I don't want you to tell me. I want you to just listen. You know, and that was hard for me, and it still is. So I have to make sure I, um, I, I react properly. But um, to see that in other people, see your, see the, your decisions you make and the, and the basis that you make your decisions in life, and then a lot of times people know what your decision will be. Like my daughter knows me inside and out because, and she'll check me. And, and that's what's wild about it. And, and, and it's a lovely thing to live with seeing that I, I I never had a you know her 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 bad years I don't know a bad year with her I didn't have a bad year with her because it's always I just looked at it as it's time to learn through this or grow through this or whatever and and to see and experience life yeah do I miss some of those younger years where she was totally dependent on us yeah but I love seeing a person birthed into the world now and, and, and the way she's, she sticks to the um, teachings that you've blessed her with in, in the way you lived your life, not just what you told her. And see, believe it or not, that's exactly what my theory is on the, on the five-spoke balance wheel. Okay. And that is that we go from authority uh -huh. to respect, to influence, to impact, to transformation, and then right back to authority. There you go. So a life that's been truly transformed is now not only under a new authority, but it's also demonstrating and giving away authority and then so on and so forth with respect. I remember having a mentor ask me one time, he said, you ever look up and realize you're in the same spot you were a year ago or five years ago or 10 years ago? And I said, 
If that were absolutely true, I'd be depressed. Right. But here's what I do find. I, I do realize that if you're on the north side of the mountain, at the base of the mountain, and you can see the river, and a year from now, you're on the north side of the mountain, and you can see the river again, the question you better be asking yourself is, are you still at the base, or are you one level up? See, I got no problem with seeing the river again. I got no problem with going around the mountain and seeing the river again, and going around the mountain and seeing the river again. But what I do know is there will be a moment while I will be on the top of the mountain, there'll be no mountain at my back. And I'll have the panoramic view of the whole thing. And my objective is to continue to grow. I don't care how many times I see that mm -hmm. river, as long as I continue to keep passing that and looking for the next thing and moving to the next level. And I, I find when we are intentional about authority and respect, about influence and impact and, and transformation, that the stories that we tell mm -hmm. do all of those things as well. As we tell the story, it demonstrates that authority. When I talked about you the other day in, in the podcast, one of the things that I made observation about from an authority standpoint was, yeah, you were very detailed in, in the hand movement and not hitting the thigh and, and that kind of stuff. But what I never saw you do is tell the wide receiver how to catch. Right. Or tell the running back how to, how to run. And there's a, a powerful understanding that a lot of people miss. You know, there's a process to athletic coaching that's different than the coaching that I do. The coaching that I do starts with a very basic premise, and that is the answer you need is already in you. My job is to ask thought-provoking, genuinely curiosity-based questions that will allow you to reveal to yourself that you already know the answer to this. What you do is in coaching is a lot more like mentoring, and by that I mean you're teaching what you've already done before. Right. So your level of authority in being a center in the NFL at the highest level with some of the best in the world, uh, Hall of Famers, Super Bowl champion winners, it, that is a notable and unquestionable authority in that position. But there's also some authority that comes in being a father, right. and authority that comes in being a businessman, and authority that comes in being on the board of a charity. And all of those have a different context, and yet there's still levels of authority that none of them came to you because you demanded them. Right. All of them came to you because you earned them and because you submitted to another authority right. to achieve them. If you'd never been coachable, you'd never be a coach. Right. If you'd never put in the hours to be disciplined, you wouldn't have the results that you have now. And I think as we look at that transformation, that's what we see. Now, one question that's just been, this is kind of a bonus question for the audience. Um, I don't know how many people have ever asked you this in an interview, but I'm, I'm curious, how terrified were you to take Kim home to New York the first time? Did she have a handful of brothers? Yeah, I've got, I've got, um, I have, there's three boys and two girls and 36 cousins. Good grief. Yes, so very, very Catholic family, you know. Um, uh, the, um, to bring her home, and actually, you know, it's kind of funny because I wasn't nervous at all because I'm that guy who, I have fun wherever I'm at and I, and I enjoy people and I enjoy life and I was nervous for her because I was like, because her family is a little more quiet, right, and reserved. And when they came to my family, it's like you sit at the table, everybody's talking, but I can hear every single conversation. I mean, you like, feel like yes, mommy, yes, and a pen full of pit bulls. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> did. And then she realized at first she was like overwhelmed, like it by it, and then now she's just part of it. You know, she's wow. grown into it, and she holds her own. and she misses it sometimes. You know, but it it is a uh, uh, my my family is you know unique. You know, and and that. But I tell you one thing: there's a lot of love there. There's a lot of battle. A typical New Yorks, New Yorkers, and um, but there is a lot of uh, a lot of love in our family, and and I love like I'll be I'll give you an example. My nephew um, long snaps for um, for Army. He's done now. He's his final. Last year was his final year. Well, a good friend of his was one of the running backs at the uh, camp the other day. Oh wow! And uh, because uh, thank you, Trump, he basically made it so if they get into the NFL, they can they can play. And then I don't know how they work out. Either they pay it off, or they go and they change. There are so many different ways that they they the allow. Student them. Loan. Um, I don't know if they do a student loan, or if they allow them to to come back later afterwards, or serve as recruiters in their town right. that they play in. There's a whole bunch of things I heard. I don't know enough about it, but all I know is now you can go to the NFL. Well, this kid's there. He's thick. He's a fullback, right? And uh, and and he and it was kind of funny. We sat down. My brother Dave and his son um, were. 
who plays at Capel, and we were um, uh, just, he was helping out, and we we're sitting down at a table next to this guy. We didn't know. And my brother looks over and he says, you from one of the academies? Because he had some military stuff on him and um, uh, sweats or whatever. He goes, yeah, Army. He goes, oh, you know my, uh, my nephew, Flannick. He goes, I was just there yesterday <laughs> at their house. You know, and he's like, small world. So, of course, I'm, I get to know him. And he, he basically says, let me tell you something. Your nephew, Scott, um, may be one of the nicest humans I know. Wow. And uh, respectful to people, no matter what he's gone through, he's respectful and polite. And uh, I was like, "Whoa, that's good to know." You know that it's it's uh, uh, such a blessing to be able to hear. Again, I hear about my daughter, but to hear about my nephew over here, and um, and then you know, of course, this guy I just liked him. He was just one of those guys. You know, I love these guys that serve us. I love the military, right? And so, of course, I was waiting. I had this one thing I was going to say. You know, you, you got to wait until it happens. You can't just say something. Right. Well, he's a running back. He, we're playing what's called inside drill, where it's the big on big guys, and it's all the run plays that go inside. Right. And there's a lot of beef being thrown around and a lot of hits, and it's hard hitting, and it's rough. Three and three in the one and three hole. Yeah, this, exactly. And it's, it's you know, um, it's, it's tough. And so the, he gets a fullback, and, and he gets through, and he hits this linebacker, and he falls into the end zone, and he hits that guy. I stand up. I yell out, you better salute that man. <laughs> I go, you better salute that man. He's an officer. Because, you know, because when you leave uh, West Point, you're an officer. Yeah. And he just look, comes over to me. He goes, man, why did you do that to me? I said, you deserve it. You earned it. You know? And now they're going to razz you. And now they're going to razz you. I said, but the good thing about it is, you know what? I wanted these scouts to hear you serve us at a different level. These guys, I remember watching you guys play against, um, you know, like I think UNT or something like that, and and you guys are getting. I said, man, here's the deal. I'm telling my brother and my wife. I'm like, I said they don't realize those guys are not just trained to play to win. They're trained and they're they are weapons yeah. that could destroy every single one of those guys probably several different ways because they go through those classes yeah. at West Point and how to do that. I said so. It's it's different, you know. It's different to play football, you know, where we're doing it for sport. They're, when they think team, that's why I love the military. When they think team, they're doing it for life. It's live bullets flying over their heads, not big guys coming to yeah. hit you. So we do it for, for uh, because it kind of reminds you of the gladiators, you know? That's what we are. We're gladiators. Well, and sports really gives you a chance to do that, especially in a younger age, yeah. long before the military. I mean, for me, it was high school football. Right. Then it was the Air Force basic training and, and then moving in. And then my job in the Air Force was firefighter. Okay. So well, there you I mean, go. you're talking about a That's team. That's another team and within a team. Five in a life situation, a life and death situation. Yep. And you got to know what your guy's doing. You got to know where he's at, what his plan is, and, and that his strategy is going to work and that he's tactically following the... The instructions and, and if you're not doing that, if you don't understand the science and the process and the procedures and follow someone them, can die. Somebody dies. Yep, yeah. someone can die. And with us, we may members, lose. There may be somebody else that you're after. Yeah, with our team, right? It's okay. We may the quarterback may get hit and you're gonna get cut. Yeah. Right? We may lose the game. You guys, things like that. It's important. The military, they could die. Yeah. And so that's why I love. If I was a coach, um, and recruiting for my team. I would absolutely look at military guys. Oh yeah. Because they understand the importance of team. They understand a different perspective on and, it. And you know, because I would I remember this many a times where I'm a sales guy, you know, and everything that I do. I tell people I go, I'm an offensive lineman. I open up holes. Never threw a touchdown, never uh, ran one in, never caught one. I said, but I helped. And all I care about is to make sure everyone does their job. Because if we do our job, everyone does You gotta we know win. your role. And no, I think that's another challenge that's with young people about, yeah. today in, in authority and respect is they all want the same position. Hmm. So many young people, they, they only want to be the quarterback. Right. Hey. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of names. I, I don't think of names off the top of my head, but Neither the number I. of guys that you hear it in the, in the commentaries, uh, you know, so-and-so uh, he's playing wide receiver, he's playing slot receiver, but he played quarterback in college. And then you see this trick play. And here he is stepping out in motion. You think he's going to do an end around or something. And instead he does a flea flicker and throws a 40-yard pass to right. the quarterback. And you're like, how did the slot receiver, because he played at the highest level as a D1 college you know, football right. player. Right. He's not a scrub. The man knows right. how to throw a spiral, knows how to place his feet, knows mm -hmm. what to do with his hips. I mean, not everybody can do the, the yeah. back dance. Right. But 
<laughs> exactly. Or any of those things. I don't understand all that stuff. I always say, act like you've been there. Okay. Yeah. There you go. I was like, uh, but it, it's a, it's a sport is a wonderful whatever it is. You know, like I said, my my uh, my daughter dates a um, uh, a pitcher. Okay, and that's a different realm of all the other players on the field. You know, right. the catcher, to me, is a person who gets to play the game because he's got it all in front of him. You know, and and you know basketball. You know, the the uh, uh, the guards and and the forwards and the center and everyone has their own positions. And like you were saying earlier about coaching, I, I coach. I know my role, and I know what I'm good at. And that's why I realized in life, I know what I'm good at. I need to surround myself with those other people that don't do what I do, yeah. or because on the offensive line, it's a team within a team. Because us five have to work together in order to move the ball, open up the hole properly, in order to keep everyone off the quarterback long enough so they can throw to those other guys out there doing their individual skills. Well, and that seems so simplistic, but the nuances that go into that, you know, did you move your feet first or did you move your head first? Did, did, you, did you give away your tell? Yep. You know, are you pass blocking or are right. you rush blocking? Right. And, and for those of us who've done that a little bit right. in the trenches, you understand that a little bit better, but there's a, there's a higher level. And you hear phrases like the big dumb jocks. Right, okay. right. And, and I, it, it cracks me up because I think about, you know, you look at a guy that, Look like a Dak or a Troy. Right. Those guys did not get to the NFL straight out of high school. Right. They went to college. Right. They have degrees. Mm -hmm. The majority of them have right. good educations. They're right. intelligent, educated, informed people yep. with great experiences background. You, know, you look at a, a Jason Witten or a Troy Eggman stepping out of the field and right. into the broadcast booth. Right. Okay, their understanding of the game, their game acumen is off the charts to begin with. Right. But they're not idiots in the world either. And so there's something about sports that, that demands the best of you from a discipline standpoint, from a perseverance standpoint, from a respect and authority standpoint. Right. And it does give you opportunity to influence and impact, but, and it also transforms who you are. When I see young guys that, that you know, they quit school, right. they give up on football. Mm -hmm. You know, my son uh, quit school and gave up on football when he got his girlfriend pregnant. Um, he really wanted to play. He was 5'9", 175 pounds, playing center. Mm -hmm. The year he quit, he had his growth spurt. Okay. He's now 6'1", 290. He could have... And you saw a couple of those guys that were 6'1", barely. And there was guys 6'1", to 6'2". And there was two guys. And get this. And I'm not going to... I'm looking at as a prototypical guy. When you look at a center, you want a guy that's 6'3", or better. Right. Got some some beef, but you know we didn't like we had these small schools that came in, and to stay and then in order to stay the extra three days they came in the first two days to stay the extra three days with the other guys that were chosen. Um, the the scouts had to put multiple check marks like each scout would okay this kid I want to see again this kid I want to see this kid I want. Well this is kid, he's six point oh seven, right six point oh seven so that's what. Barely, just under 6'1". Yeah. A quarter inch away, roughly. And he comes in, but he's thick, and he was a good athlete. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm like, he's, he's coming over? You know, the guy, he was good. He had all, everything, he was good. But the, what happens was one of the teams um, said he's just like this guy, and we've had great success with him, so we're looking for that body type again. I and mean, this is, I think he might be able to fill that spot. So we'd like to see how, much, how better he does with the better talent that comes in the next couple of days. So we brought him over. He's probably one of our, one of our better centers um, that played. Now, he can't play guard. He's too short-armed. But at center, might be able to, because sometimes the smaller quarterbacks like that, too, because you don't have this huge guy in front of you where they got to ride him and everything like that and to get the under, under, under snap. But, uh, but it was a – I was I – was, um, even shocked that someone was looking at that, but when he, they explained they've had success with this guy, before, with this other guy, and he named them, and I said, yeah. And he says, so we'd like to just see if maybe you know he fills, can, can fill that same spot. I'm not saying we're going to go after him, but I'd like to see him play more. I was like, you know what? I should have, because we didn't, we don't pick the guys. You know, the the scouts pick them. Who gets to move up? I told him, I said, hey, I'm gonna, and I told him straight up, I said, I was thinking something different, so I apologize. But 
you did something that make sure change their mind and say, hey, he, you stood out. So 14 guys out of, let's see, well, four out of, um, we'll put it this way, one, four out of 17 guys that I was coaching that early part, four guys were moved up to play another three days. Wow. That means the other guys went home, okay? Um, and, then, and then here's the other thing. One of those guys was six foot eight, 300 pounds. Wow. Played at a small D3 school, so he wasn't used to the speed. Well, a D3 is a small division uh, of college players. And, um, and so he wasn't used to, to the, the, the D1, you know, the top level, you know, college athletes. And a lot faster, a lot stronger, and a lot more things to do. And he never got really good coaching is what he said. It's like, okay, well, man, you're six foot eight. You can't coach that. And you're 300 pounds. You got a good frame. Maybe someone's going to want to bring you into camp and use you as, a, you know, and develop you, yeah. you know, and give you a couple of years to develop so you get used to it and put some time into you. Um, but unfortunately, they didn't, um, they didn't pick you to go, but I wish you the best. Just wish you did something else that you could do. And um, I said, like, long snap or something like that. He looks at me, he goes, like a face like this, he goes, oh, coach, I'm not going to lie to you. I can snap the blank out of, uh, out of the ball. And I go, what? What's your numbers? And he told me his numbers. So said, go in the middle of the field right now and start snapping. I said, I'll, 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 I'll go. It was the end of practice. I had to go. I found Green Bay and I found the Rams, right? I said, hey, I'm telling you. And I told him numbers. I go, what? I go, yeah. I said, that can help you with a roster spot because it's all about roster yeah, spots. Where does he fit? Yeah. Where does he fit? You know, if he guy can be I mean, most a... Can hear, most he, people can carry two long snappers. Right, if he can... Well, um, if you have one long snapper, that, that's all they have is one long... And that's all he does, long snap. That's it. Yeah. But if you have... Uh, and they usually have like a backup offensive lineman that can do it just in case something happens to you or a tight end or someone like that right. can long snap. Might not be as good, but this is the guy. Dale Hellestray played 17 years with the Cow... 11 years with the Cowboys. That was 17 years. Um, the guy that's there right now, he's been, I think, year 14. JP. Wow. He's probably got one more year left is what I've heard. Well, when I hear that, JP makes 1.6. This guy comes in, one, he could make a, you know, one third of that or less. And that, that could be an opportunity you know, for him right now. He'd start. Yeah. So I said, you know what? And, and it also saves the, the, the Cowboys over a million dollars, right? Just saying, you're ready to retire anyway. So, <laughs> um, uh, so what happens is I go and I... I um, uh, I had this kid, and I said, can you come back in the morning, right? He's like, yeah, my flight leaves at 1 o'clock. I'm like, okay, I'll get here early. And I, that night, I went on this frantic call on every scout that I know and, and call on the coaches that, we, you know, that work with the specialists. With, that's long snappers and punters and kickers, holders. And, uh, and talk to him and then talk to the other coaches. And, and then I said, okay, so next morning, we're taking some snaps and, and, um, and we're timing them and filming them and all stuff like that. Okay. I'm sitting there watching yesterday afternoon. This guy's already home. And I go to the, uh, I talk to the, I mean, I talked about 15 teams for him. But I just happen to be watching these guys say, hey, well, what's a good time, you know, for long snappers? And the guy's like, oh, well, he goes, you want, you know, 0.77 so for a, for a um, you know, from snap to punter grabs it. Right. Um, you know, 0.77, 0.75 or, or less, we, we really, we look at them. I go, okay. And I said, uh, so, I hit the video. I go, 0.65, is that pretty good? <laughs> and he goes, that's a starter in the NFL. I said, well, you need to call this guy. Plus, he's six foot eight. He's what? Six foot eight, 300 pounds. He goes, what? I go, yeah. He goes, I, he goes, I need his number. So I was like, okay, well, here. So I call him up. I text him. I said, hey, I, talk, I listed all the teams. There was probably about 10 or 15 that I listed for him. I said, here's who I talked to for you. He goes, should I tell my agent? I said, sure. I said, but just tell him he owes me money. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. I mean, that's what I was, I was able to, a kid who had talent, I was able to maybe extend his career and make it. Okay, him. so I'm going to take this right back to my spokes again, though, because none of those people would have had, if I had made the same phone calls, uh -huh. right. said he's 6'8", et cetera, none right. of them would have taken my phone call. Right. You're right. None of them would have responded to that. But the authority that you have because of the positions you've held, the yep. things that you've accomplished, mm -hmm. gives you influence in their life so you can make an impact in his life. They respect your success. Right. So you're lending him your credibility. So what made you, though, look at this kid and go, 
he deserves a chance. Now, you said your job as an offensive lineman and as a salesman is to open holes and make connect, make a And I saw an people. opportunity where I could help two people because it's got to be a win-win situation, right? right. I got to put someone who I think can play for this team. I, mean, I don't want to put a bad guy on the team. Right. Right? Because then I get a bad reputation too and I lose my authority. That's exactly right. right. So what happens with I'm like, hey, guys, look at this guy. You know, I, he, he was, he's going home. He's an okay offensive tackle. But he could be big because he's got, he could be good because he's got size. You can't coach the size. Right. But he does have that size. But this is what else he does. They're like, what? Yeah, because everybody else is looking at 6'8", 300, and they're going, tackle. Right. Yeah. Is, yeah. He, is he good at a tackle? Right. Worst case scenario, is he a good pulling guard? Right. Right. Or, you know, can he, can he right. trim down and be a right. tight end? Right, right, right. Right. But he, at this point, they're not looking for him to be a tight end. They're looking for him to be a tackle or a guard. And that's it. At 6'8", 300 pounds, that's what you're going to play. And mostly tackle. And they're like, well, his feet good enough? Whatever. You know? And then, okay, if he's not that good yet, we'll keep him in a confined space. We'll put him at guard because there's not, there's not two-way go. Yeah. It's, it's like, whereas, uh, I should say, there's, only, there's, there's a short period of time. A tackle, they say you're out on an island because here's a tackle, right? Here's a tackle out here. And okay, let's do this. Center, guard, tackle. Defensive end. You know, he come in here, you're protected in here, but there's no protection out here. Right. You're on an island. So you better be a really good athlete. You gotta be able to backpedal fast. Here is your you can't you bump into this guy, you're bumping into this guy. So right. let's get him situated here. We did that with Flozell Adams. He played guard first. Then they moved him to tackle as he got better, you know, with the Cowboys. And who was with the Cowboys for what, over ten years, I think. And um, so yeah, so now this guy may have an opportunity. He may just be a long snapper and that's it. But he didn't think he was going to go to the pros just being a long snapper. But he could have a Dale Hellestray 17 years as a long snapper in the NFL, made millions of dollars, and was able to impact how many people? Now here's a question, okay? Um, isn't that considered what an apostle does? You teach someone else, you give them the opportunity, you give them the strength and the understanding of what their talents are so that they can go make more disciples and they can go make, I mean, my authority gave him authority to be able to go to the next level and then he builds his own authority and then how many people are he going to touch? Yeah. So technically, whoever he touches down the road will be one of my disciples. And that, and that really is what the five levels is about. And that's why we call it leading leaders. Uh -huh. I mean, it, there are a lot of people out there and this has kind of been a bandwagon of mine. There are a lot of people out there that call themselves influencers or that others call influencers. And they've got 10, 20, or 1,000, or a million followers on mm -hmm. uh, Instagram or Facebook or whatever else. And, and I look at those and I say, but that's awesome. But I love the way John Maxwell's philosophy works out. He said, I, I could amass a lot of followers, but when I die, those followers are going to scatter. Mm -hmm. They're going to look for somebody else. <clears throat> Jesus had 5,000 that came to him for food. He had 12 that followed him everywhere, three that went to the, to the worst moments of his life, and one that never left. Mm -hmm. And that's the one we still talk about today. Right. It's the one you accidentally named your daughter after and wanted to name your son after. That one, though, has changed the world right. in, in more ways than we can count. If I spend my life and I influence the 5,000, that's awesome. If I influence the 12, that's even better. And if I have that deep of an impact and those three are that one, then I'm leading leaders, and that's why the podcast is called Leading Leaders. The very first interview series that we did was for Meet the Messenger TV. The intent was that it would all be for broadcast for a television network right, that right. I was working at at the time. And we shot 65 interviews over a period of a few months and started the editing process. And the very first one we did, the live stream camera was at the back of the room, behind the lights, behind the microphones, behind the, the, even behind the people. And I got an email, long email from a guy, and he said, uh, hey, I love the interview, love the content, it was great, I learned a lot. Uh, he said, but can I, can I ask you to do one thing? And I said, what's that? And he said, I, I couldn't hear it that well, because it's behind the microphone. Gotcha. And he said, and I couldn't see it that well. Can you, can you fix that? Well, my marketing mind kicks in, and I said, you know, the reason I put that camera back there is because this is for broadcast. I mean, right. we're filming with the studio cameras for broadcast. That's right. the purpose of this. So you just have to watch it on TV when the when the final edited, polished, perfect thing comes out. And he said, great, what channel is that on in Nigeria? Oh, gotcha. And that was kind of a kick to the gut. 
And mm-hmm. so I, I prayed about that and God said, listen, you know, if I'm going to give you the tools for influence, influence where I put you. And shortly after that, I, like I was that. in the condo. Like and so that what we're doing now is not for television broadcasts. If some network wants to pick it up, I don't care. That's fine. But what we're doing now is specifically designed uh-huh. so that in a very quick period of time, some of those 65 interviews have never been seen by anybody except uh-huh. the back of the room live stream gotcha. shot. Because it takes so much when you've got studio quality cameras, it takes so much to edit them. It became a barrier of time and expense. Right. So I have interviews that I shot on Tuesday that will air tomorrow because the speed to market in this format is so much higher, Yeah. which means the quality is still there. The content is there. I can get people in and out. We can have massive numbers of interviews and, and more than one interview and, and talk for long periods of time because we're not under any constraints. I don't have a 24 and a half right. minute limitation. I don't have you know sponsors who are begging me to talk about this particular thing. Right. And so we love this idea. We love this format. We love this this space. But it really goes back to that whole idea of influence and who is it we want to influence? Is it the one? Are, are we still doing it for the one? Absolutely. Right. So I want you to take just a couple of minutes, if you will, and understanding the framework that, mm-hmm. you know, when five or 6,000 people watch these videos, probably less than a thousand of those are in the U.S. Right. They're in India, they're in Africa, they're in the Congo where I travel to in Brazil, right. in Cuba, in Nigeria. And most of these are young men, 18 to 24, right. who are saying, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be, you know, busy in the world? What does it mean to be successful in business? And obviously, many of them look at America as a pinnacle of success and, as, you know, superstar athletes as a pinnacle of success mm-hmm. and achieving that first million dollars or having that car or living in that house as a pinnacle of success. So people would say, well, you lived in Westlake and you drove XYZ kind of car and you had that kind of job title and, and you made that kind of money. What's that like in comparison? And what does it mean to be a real man in light of that? Well, in speaking, you, know, you talk about worldwide, I was able to play football and carry my message of who I am and it and evolved over the years. I played football all over the United States in college, um, playing football teams in different colleges. I went to the NFL and the CFL and the World League and was able to play in the United States a game in Mexico, two games, three games in Germany, two different places, Barcelona, all over Canada, and um, I was able to, never mind how far, where they were broadcast to, right. right, the world, I was able to touch the lives of so many by playing a game. Um, now I'm able to touch the lives because of the authority, the, the platform the Lord blessed me with uh, by speaking places like this. You know, um, who to, th- I always like to say, who to thunk a boy from New York would end up coming to Texas to become a cowboy and would be seen all over the world and be able to, I mean, I've been on the TBNs, I've been on the um, Day Stars, I've been on those channels um, for many years when I was playing um, uh, Super Bowl. Uh, Super Bowl uh, interviews, things like that. Uh, winning championships is another thing that allows you to gives a, gives you a platform. But what does that give me? Nothing unless I use it for a platform. And because of that, I'm able to speak at full gospel businessmen's luncheons, at um, uh, regular businesses, at um, chamber of commerces, at schools, at you know, you name it. Um, at churches, I'm able to, you know, tell my testimony, and um, and then I, I get a lot of people that get to li- that get to that I get to speak to into their lives and help them. So, what's it mean to be a man? Chivalry, you know, man, act like you've been there. It's nothing new when you get to that pinnacle of success. Don't think you don't read your own paper clippings. Don't believe your own press. Don't believe your own press because you read the paper clippings one day, and an example is Dallas Cowboy first start. I end up winning the ball, the game ball. Who votes on that? Your teammates. Remember, I described who were my teammates. Yeah. They're Hall of Famers. And they voted because I played so well, they voted for me. And I got a game ball that game. 
Two weeks later, playing in New Orleans. I snapped the ball over Troy's head. John Madden tears me up. <laughs> I, thought it was, I thought it was horrible, right? I, over here, I was the best thing since sliced bread. Over here, I don't even know what I was. I couldn't describe it. You know, some amoeba over here that John Madden tore up. Stuck on the bottom of his shoe. <laughs> on the bottom of his shoe that he flicked <laughs> off, right? We're so bad, I got chewed up that even, you know, Mr. Jones came up and said, Mike, you know, you only had like three bad plays in that game. He says, but they were really bad. <laughs> you know, and one wasn't and even your fault. And, and, and one, one wasn't even your fault. You know, and, and he, but, but then, so it gave me a little bit. He, he, that literally lifted me back up, and I played the rest of the season fine, but it was that just you get that game. And you know, sometimes in life, you might get that game. Whether it be in football, sports, whatever, in your marriage, in business, or whatever, You've got to learn to overcome and not read your own paper clippings that are, or not your own, but what has been written about you. Right. You know, you've got to be what was spoken about you is called what Jesus Christ did. You know, he's the one who, uh, if, you say, if you put your faith in him, you know, uh, you have to set yourself in something above of what you are, greater than you, right? Um, if you look at that, then no, he looks at you as perfection. So although, my, all I have, although I have all these imperfections, he sees the perfections. Although when I'm coaching, and I, like the other last few days, and it's still raw in my heart, I got to see so many imperfections that I got to go tweak with these guys to help them find out how they get better at one thing or another. Um, that's what Christ did for us. And that's what I believe in my heart. That's, <coughs> that was, allows me to move on to the next day. Um, I do this thing. It's... it's um, it's actually a Jewish thing, but I believe in it. It's called the Modani. And basically, you thank God every morning when you wake up. You wake up in the morning, I thank God that he brought my... Because they, they believe when you sleep, it's like you're, 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 you're asleep, but you're... It's, he explained to me, and it's kind of funny if you look it up. It's this Jewish guy with a Jewish, like a New York Jewish accent. Yeah. He's like, so it's like you're dead. You're laying there. You don't do, move nowhere, right? And it's funny. I like it but, because I know a lot of people like that. They're friends of mine. And I, so I, can, I can imitate them very well because I lived with them, right? And so it's like, you know, you're laying in there, and then it's like, Lord, you return my life back to me. Nishmati means my breath of life. You breathe back into me yeah. when I woke up in the morning. Thank you. It's me to you, face to face, essence to essence. Thank you for breathing your life back into me, or my, your breath of life back into me, returning my soul to my body, basically, so that I can go try to do another, you know, so that I can go and, great, first of all, great is your faithfulness is part of it too, but it's now, it's like, because you, I may be a used tool, and you put it in the corner the next morning, it's still a used tool. But when you, I go to bed and I sleep at night, my soul returns refreshed, renewed, ready to go again, brand new to start a new day. Lord, let me get today right. Today I'm going to work on getting it right. And if I don't, I'll see you in the morning. I'm not going to have three plays like last game. <laughs> exactly. exactly. It's, it's your, you know what, you get each day. So I, I say, thank you, Lord, for great is your faithfulness that every day I get to start a new day and let me start it out right. And let, me, let, me, let this be that day where I'm that perfect instrument of yours. Is it always happened that way? No, but guess what? When I wake up the next morning, I say the same thing. And then, I, of course, I go into my devotional and things like that, my, my Christianese, right? Um, my Jesus is Calling devotional is what I like. That's my own personal one. But, uh, but it's been a blessing, and, and that's really what I do. So each day, thank God for the day. I thank God for the day. I thank God that he, he returned his breath of life into me. You know, we're not promised tomorrow, but when I wake up, I, I want to thank him. And so I thank him, and um, I have a friend of mine who uh, um, actually was, was trying to do the meditation, was trying to get closer to be becoming, hearing God's Word. So he wanted to get deeper into meditation and hearing God's Word. And this guy started talking about prayer and meditation. It's a rabbi right next door to him. So he just had a conversation with him. He goes, well, we're talking. He goes, it's funny you ask. He goes, I'm, we're talking about prayer and meditation. So he goes, he started out with a midday. Yeah, it me so, a so, bit. so deep. And I was like, and that's really what I've been doing for about a month and a half now. And I just thank God every morning. And, and, and sometimes I forget and I start it in the afternoon. But it's like I still want to thank him because I get another day 
to try to, you know, to, to try to represent you perfectly here. Not that, you know, I mean, I know I'm already forgiven, I'm covered, right? Right. But now I get another chance. So I hope everyone listening takes that advice and starts every day understanding that the breath of life is breathed back into you as if you were recreated every morning and you get to start a new day for him. Excellent. Thank you. Mike, I appreciate you being Thank here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks again for watching. I appreciate you guys being a part of the Leading Leaders podcast. Please feel free to share this, subscribe on the website so you can get these via email and uh, let everybody know they can reach out to Mike for any kind of coaching, uh, speaking engagements and things of that nature. What's the best way to reach you? Quite honestly, Facebook is the best thing right now at, at my Mike Kislak. So you can go to my Facebook friends and search him there. Or yours. Obviously, yeah. you'll see a post on there. But I uh, would love for you to engage with Mike and, and have him come and speak at your organization or coach your kids if they're, if they're trying to improve in their sports game. Thank you for being a part of what we're doing here. Help us spread the message. And thank you for watching the 2020 Servant Leader Series on Leading Leaders Podcast. I'm Jay Lauren Norris. Have a blessed day.